Hello, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I welcome you all. Uh, welcome to the Chillaxing and Chit Chatting podcast. I am your host, Miguel Whittle, also known, of course, by my username, Time Agent MW. Um, and I'm here to go ahead and uh, do my fifth episode, I believe, um, my fifth episode uh, or sixth, um, talking about the uh, Doctor Who episode, um, The Church on Ruby Road, uh, which is the Christmas special that aired uh, just over a month ago. So, yeah, I'm a bit late to the Christmas special sort of thing, but um, I thought I'd go ahead and talk about and share my thoughts on this. And I'm kind of in a similar thing to the previous episodes, just recording my thoughts, and then I'm going to upload each of the episodes individually at some point once I've, you know, once I've done this episode at least. And, um, yeah, I thought I'd share my thoughts on, of course, the uh, Christmas special that just aired. Um, the Christmas special being, uh, of course, the first full adventure to star Shitty Jack was the 15th Doctor. We'd seen him previously in The Giggle, which is the third special of the 60th anniversary. But we hadn't seen him fully um, take on the role as the star, not until, of course, this episode. And I watched this on Boxing Day because on Christmas Day, usually I'm with my family or whatever. And uh, so I don't have the time to be able to watch it. But here I am now to go ahead and um, talk about this episode in detail in full and i'm sure that most of you will have seen it but i'll share once again i'm going to do a spoiler non-spoiler type thing um i think um i'll do the non-spoiler at the very end of the episode so that people can leave but i'm going to go ahead and talk about this episode and then i'm going to uh do as far as i know if i go onto my document on word about the podcast i think i'll just just so i know also like the that i'm doing this right in terms of the uh yeah in terms of in terms of knowing what each segment is of course and also actually i will go ahead and um uh talk about um uh the um uh talk about the uh so i'm just going ahead and searching this up uh this is on the podcast here uh it's just a document i'm just looking for to check the podcast script here we go okay so there we go uh Yep, time at Big Finish. I've got a couple of audios to take a look at as well for Big Finish. Uh, but first of all, let's talk about The Church on Ruby Road, which is the episode um, about the Doctor Who Christmas episode. Um, so the Doctor Who episode, uh, the Christmas episode, actually, I've just decided, in a bit of an unexpected turn, sorry, to actually share my screen on Letterbox because um, I thought, you know what, to make it easier as well, to make it easier so I don't have a trouble like moving bits and segments around and having people do a time skip. I'm first going to actually go ahead and talk about uh, the movies that I took a look at. So this will be at the movies. I like to call it. I'll probably call it at the movies where I'll talk about some of the movies that I've reviewed and just going ahead and letting you know in more detail about the reviews I did here on Letterboxd because I've done shorter reviews. I'd say shorter. They're still a bit long anyways, but talking about the Dark Knight trilogy. This is what I'm going to be talking about. So if you don't follow me, I, I do have a Letterboxd account. It's just my name, Miguel Whittle, here. You can follow it there to take a look at reviews. I try and write up as many reviews as I can. And I've been keeping up to date, writing more reviews as time goes on. Uh, the um, Starting from around mid-December, I started doing reviews for um, Christopher Nolan films, for the Christopher Nolan uh, movies. Um, so the Christopher Nolan, so I've started doing like a marathon, sort of like a, a watch along of all of the movies directed by Christopher Nolan. So I'm going ahead and taking a look at all the films that he's directed, feature films. I started with uh, Tenant, which I've done a three and a half star review on, which I enjoyed, but I will say there was a couple of issues surrounding it. Um, and now I'm on to the next uh, films that I looked at from Nolan, which is the Dark Knight trilogy. So first up is Batman Begins, which is from 2005, which um now realizing that's about nearly 20 years ago, which is kind of insane. But Batman Begins in 2005 is interesting. So the context surrounding Batman Begins is interesting because you have here a um a movie that originally was um. Uh, so if you go back to the Batman franchise, originally Batman had a movie franchise beginning in 1989 with Tim Burton as director. Michael Keane was the star and that was quite successful. The first one, Batman Returns, not successful. And that was a too dark and depressing and it was too grim for it being a film that could get a lot of advertising for toys and everything. Like, for instance, it was um, getting a McDonald's originally. McDonald's was originally going to provide it with a Happy Meal tie in, but 
the movie on the movie's violence and everything was just yeah there was too much violence and it was too dark and it was too moody to get any sort of like happy meal tie-in and then eventually tim burton got replaced with joel schumacher made batman forever and then of course batman and robin in 1987 and after batman and robin the batman franchise was dormant for a long time and then you go to 2005 and ign did an interesting um video i remember talking about uh, this film and Casino Royale, which was the Daniel Craig's first film as James Bond, they both released around near the same time. They both also did the similar thing where they put the series that were seen at the time as very silly with their last films, in this case, Batman and Robin. And then for James Bond, it was Die Another Day. And then they took those franchises and put them into a much more serious route. And yeah, Batman Begins is much more serious. It's a more realistic take on the series, but I think High Top points this out. And I think one thing that Batman Begins does have over the other Dark Knight films is it does feel more comic booky. This does feel more comic book like in terms of the work put onto it. I think it's mainly when you take a look at, say, the Narrows, that location in um in Batman Begins, where the location is very much um akin to a um is a very much this very comic book like setting and it kind of reminds me of um actually the gotham that you kind of see in um in a in a in bat in a the in the batman the recent uh uh gotham the recent movie from uh matt reeves of course with robert Pattinson. but there's a rain there's fog all over the city it has this very drab depressing area it looks like a part of my french here a shithole it looks like a it looks like a terrible place it looks like a place you wouldn't want to live in it's a very and it's filled to the brim with criminals and everything and actually as you can see as the article it does have a sort of Blade Runner feel to it and it it looks really really cool and whilst I enjoy the other Dark Knight films obviously Dark Knight and Dark Knight Rises the one thing Batman Begins does have is that it has a very much a um it has a very much akin to a um uh it it does have very much um this very drab and comic book like setting towards it that I really like. It also has, in my opinion, the best voice for Batman. I think Christian Bale, he's great in these films, but I think in terms of the Batman voice, I think his best one was this one, where he doesn't always put on such a gravelly voice that gets mocked now on the internet. It's very easy to mock it because it's such an easy like voice in it. Some people might just think it takes away the seriousness of some scenes, like when Batman says, this city just proved to you that it's full of people ready to believe in good, like you know, that bit in The Dark Knight. Um, that's a little line there or like you know where is he or something like that or where are they you know or where's the trigger sort of thing uh, and um when you go on to the um when you go on to those um those scenes oh. okay now i think there's something coming on here I think that's the scrap metal truck coming by. Sorry about that. That distracted me. But anyways, uh, Batman's voice here, because he, he will say like, uh, Falcone works at the Ducks or something like that. He'll say some line, but Bale doesn't put on as much of a voice that is so exaggerated or like such graveliness. When he's talking to some of his friends or whatever, he puts on less of a voice there. And it works. It really works. I think that works for it. And also, um, you know, there's a great cast put onto this, I mentioned, because um, I read, I watched it behind the scenes a little bit, and Nolan said that he likes Richard Donner's Superman, and the thing about that film is there's quite a established cast behind it. I mean, you had Marlon Brando in that Superman film, so he puts on this great established actors put onto it, like Morgan Freeman's Lucius Fox is great, I think, because um, what Lucius Fox is great at, uh, what's great about Lucius is that he, Morgan Freeman has a lot of great quips and banter surrounding batman and he doesn't outright say but he knows that bruce wayne's batman and he has that great uh dynamic behind bruce where he's often like kind of the cue to batman's james bond where he's introducing them to the gadgets and everything and it all looks really really cool and whilst batman's origin was explored beforehand this is the first film where it's really about batman so not only do you get lucius fox showing the gadgets so you know about where Batman gets like the Batmobile, for instance, it's this tumbler, it's this tank. But you also have other bits like um the Batman deciding to uh uh you know Batman did, how did he train martial arts and uh how for instance yeah where did he get all the um equipment from Lucius Fox of course and also just why did he decide bats and it's of course because it's a thing he fears and he wants criminals to also fear bats in some way and um the action as I said. Is um I did mention that one of the criticisms surrounding the um film was the action was um 
perhaps not particularly amazing because the action was just very um the action was just very much uh in this film anyways it's edited very oddly so it has this odd action um where the editing is just constant cutting constant cutting um so it's like it's very much because there's loads of cuts and because also the character of Batman when he's fighting it's up close you don't often see what's going on it's not the worst editing I've seen I think Quantum of Solace another James Bond film has much worse editing in terms of action that film actually does have genuinely action where you just don't know what's going on whereas in this film I think you sometimes won't know what's going on but some cases you do uh, but the editor was Lee Smith and I think aside from that the the editing is actually quite good because this is another thing that Nolan has done in other films. I think it is um, like Oppenheim, which I'll review at another point. But with films like these, despite being quite long, he does often like with the Batman Begins, of, uh, for instance, there is a lot of cuts behind it. And there's cuts that come along loads of times. So and because there's quite a number of cuts, um, a high top point this out, there's a number of cuts in the film where if you're wondering who it is, high tops a YouTuber, high top films. But there's a number of cuts where usually most of the shots have about a couple of seconds and then bam it cuts to another shot and that's to keep the audience engaged and i think it works it's not just for short attention span it actually works and also um what does work as well is um the edit is um is that when is that whenever there's a shot that's more than like just a couple of seconds it lingers onto the viewer and you know the importance of that and it's really good as well like when you have bruce at one point um there's a shot for instance where it lingers on Bruce where he decides to throw away a gun he was almost going to use on the man who murdered his parents uh, because he was, you know, so vengeful and angry. And he realizes later on that that's not right. He shouldn't use guns and be as vengeful. And that's really great to watch. And Bale overall is, does a good job in this film. I think he does a great job playing the role of both Bruce Wayne and Batman. And you don't feel like you're waiting the clock for Bruce to become Batman because the script is engaging and the character of Bruce is interesting, his development and how he becomes Batman and his this and how he eventually gets the role of Batman. It's the first film where you actually fully see it. And I suppose it's going to be a similar thing. I suppose what's going to happen now is I don't think obviously we've had the Batman. And I think the thing is, if there's a new retake on Batman with the DCU, for instance, I don't think we're going to get something akin to this film where it's the full origin of Batman. Because I think most people know the origin of Batman. And I think it's just something that I don't think people will want to see, perhaps. Um, they may see it at some point. I know Amazing Spider-Man did the full Spider-Man origin. And that was just made a couple of years after Spider-Man 3. Um, but... Regarding also the script as well, the script by Christopher Nolan and also David S. Goyer is also really great as well because the action isn't perhaps what I think people love about this film. What people love a lot is the dialogue scenes where you have scenes that are just very big and they take a more artistic route and they treat it with a lot of maturity and respect with the source material, like the bit with Liam Neeson meeting um, uh, as a Dukan, as he calls himself, I believe, at the start of the film, meeting Bruce Wayne and him saying, uh, you know, about making himself more than just a man, and a lot, and there's also the scene bef after that where they're in, the, they're outside, they're in the fire, and um, they're by a campfire, sort of a fire, and they're talking about their lives. So the card talks about his wife that he once had and that's a really great bit as well in terms of action though the chase the chase where the police are chasing batman and he's using the tumbler that to me was a top tier scene i think it was a really great scene to watch and it's very exciting and also as well as that this film and the other dark knight films as well uh people forget that the script as well has the actors deliver some actually really funny lines um there's some really great um um uh, there's some really great lines in the film, actually, and there's some, and I mean that in terms of the witty lines. Like, there's a bit where Batman throws a gadget and uh, to escape from the police at one point in this like jail in Arkham Asylum, I think it is Arkham Asylum. He throws it, and it's like there's some people, some patients in there, and then Batman says, "Excuse me," and then he just walks out. And there's also the bit where he's in the tumbler, and um, Rachel has been attacked by Scarecrow's beer toxin, and um, he says. Um, they can't you've been poisoned and yeah as i said scarecrow's in the film played by um killian murphy and he's also good as well and there's also he also plays more into that fun theatrical line like people talk about mr freeze and puns or whatever but then you have scarecrow in this trilogy who 
tells Batman that he needs to lighten up and he like puts himself puts Batman on fire and that bit was quite funny as well um so I actually really enjoyed uh, Batman Begins and I I don't know I think that even though I think the Dark Knight which I'm going to get into now is more is in my opinion better than Batman Begins it's only by a slight margin I still think Batman Begins is a bit underappreciated I think because of um I think because the Dark Knight is like everyone talks about that film and how great of a sequel that was people might forget that batman begins also started this trilogy and it was really darn solid i remember if you go and watch reviews or listen to reviews of mark kermode and roger ebert those are the critics that'll say they finally got batman right this time and those critics are the ones that'll say yeah this one is the one that got batman right because it treats batman with a lot of care a lot of sincerity and it's overall a really solid entry in this trilogy and i think it's a one that i think is underappreciated it introduces batman it focuses on him completely he has a full-blown character arc learning about how to be batman because he does dress up as batman for the first time but as the film progresses he learns more about you know being batman and how to best utilize his character of batman um whilst he's obviously um you know whilst he's also helping to keep up the legacy of his parents and his father and um, the legacy that they had in Gotham. And that's why I also like Alfred in this film, in these films where in this film, for instance, he's being critical towards um, Bruce in terms of what he's doing and his approach. And I like that he's not just constantly, you know, s supporting his master or whatever. He'll go ahead and question his antics because he wants to make sure and see the best out for him and make sure to protect him. And that's why I think in these films, Alfred is really solid, and Michael Caine, I think, does a great job as Alfred. I don't know, I, I've seen the previous two Batman films, I've seen Batman and Batman Returns, and obviously I've seen The Batman, but I even if I was to see the other Batman films, I think that this might be the best Alfred that we've had in terms of on-screen Alfreds, because it's, it's an Alfred that's interesting and also provides great advice to Batman, to Bruce mainly, especially in The Dark Knight, where he has to provide Bruce some some support and also advice whilst Bruce takes on the Joker and in this film it's uh Alfred you know questioning uh Bruce into this idea of becoming Batman and in a way the Dark Knight Rises it comes back to that but in this case it's uh Bruce Wayne coming back as Batman and Alfred questioning about if it's a good idea to come back into this role of vigilantism and um, talking about you know, how long is he going to be Batman. And that's an interesting, I think, dynamic to it. And uh, yeah, I think Batman Begins is a really solid um, Batman film. And then we have The Dark Knight. And uh, yeah, I think most people have heard about this. May or may not. Uh, but joking aside, yeah, the, the in terms of superhero films, it's interesting because when people, when Martin Scorsese, for instance, or other directors who I admire will talk about superhero films and their disdain for it. They're not being specific, I think. That's the problem, is that when they're talking about it, they're not talking about, you know, all superhero films. Because if that's the case, what about The Batman that came out recently or Joker, for instance? Those films that were very much artistic and I think are the not typical comic book flair. I mean, you go on to something like The Dark Knight, you know, directed by a highly established, really beloved director like Christopher Nolan, that's also considered by most people as one of the greatest films of all time. Now, I've given this four stars. I don't hold it to as high an esteem as maybe other people do, but I can see why. In a similar way, I view Oppenheimer highly, but maybe not as high as other people do. In a similar thing to The Dark Knight, because this film overall is really darn solid. I do think that The Dark Knight is better than Batman Begins, but I don't know if it's as good as Batman Begins. As I said in my review, I was very eager to check it out because I really enjoyed Batman Begins. I was hyped up and I was like, I want to check out The Dark Knight because what I'm doing with the Nolan films is usually watching them once a week. But with The Dark Knight, it was like, I have to watch this one after watching Batman Begins. Hype from watching the Batman Begins. And also, I really want to check out this film because I haven't seen it in a while. And, you know, I want to see how this film is. And overall, I really enjoyed. The thing about this film as well is um much like the dark, much like Batman Begins, it's paced really well. It's a film that's quite long. Uh it's a, a bit of a long film, but it doesn't feel massively long. Or even if it does, you don't have much of a problem with it because it just is paced really darn well. It paces itself really well and it does a really good job um 
just overall being a great sequel to the Batman Begins and tackling and uh, going back to what Batman Begins had and then moving along with that with more themes about it. So you have the Joker who um, goes along and is questioning Batman's morality and also questioning his ideas. And also Batman is suddenly faced with someone who is also very much theatrical like him, but does it for chaos and anarchy. And as he says, he's an agent of chaos. And he basically is just this mysterious figure who just drops in and causes chaos and havoc and doesn't really have necessarily a full-blown plan he just decides to just like do whatever he just decides i'm gonna do whatever i want to do that's kind of what i'm gonna do i'm just gonna just do whatever just do whatever i want to do and of course uh talking about the joker that's one of the main things to of course talk about with the dark knight that this was a film that um of course had Great performances throughout, but of course, the one performance that stole it was Heath Ledger as the Joker, who um, went ahead and uh, sadly passed away in 2008, but thankfully, but um, did win the um, Oscar for uh, Best uh, Supporting Actor. It was a posthumous Oscar. I think it was the first Oscar to win, the first person to win that award as well. It was a very special, um, very, very... Um, special award to win so he won the award for best um for best supporting actor it was a posthumous award and the thing is i read a i read a tweet actually last night about this and one of the things obviously about Heath Ledger's joker is that even as a kid as well he was pretty darn scary he's very scary like for instance in the scene where he um he's going ahead and uh says i'm a man of my word and he's in he's uh hide this guy to a chair who's trying to be this impersonator of Batman like there's that bit here where he's on the news report that bit is pretty darn scary but people forget as well that Heath Ledger is actually really funny in the film and people forget about it like there's a bit where he's in the in a prison cell and he's like and uh he goes ahead and uh this guy says you killed six of my men and the Joker just says like that he doesn't say it but he like lip sings he like he says that and uh just that bit is actually quite funny and you also have the bit where he um he goes ahead and um uh you also have the bit where he goes ahead and um uh gets a pencil and he says i'm gonna make this pencil disappear Ta-da! Ah, it's gone like that's quite funny or like he um gets uh he get, shows out his grenade from his coat he has all these bombs strapped to his coat and he says let's not blow this out of proportion and then the gambled says you think you can just steal from us and walk away and he goes yeah <laughs> that bit's actually really funny and that's the thing he plays was, was funny in the film but he's also scary and i think that's the thing people forget and like when they're trying to do their joker and it's like taking his brush from the dark and it's like you forget that he's actually he's funny he's meant to make people laugh he's he's a clown so he's obviously making people laugh whilst at the same time trying to scare them completely. And that's what's really great about it. And actually, the Batman impersonator is also pretty great as well, because that delves into this interesting idea about Batman, about that he's inspired people, but he's also inspired these people who, you know, are deciding to take on the role of Batman. That's quite an interesting bit, I think, that's put into the film, that um, that um, that comes into the film. And also, you know, I mentioned in my review that I think perhaps um, one of the best things about the film is Harvey Dent and not just with the performance but I think people kind of forget because Joker is so great that the rest of the cast are kind of less talked about but all the cast are terrific and Aaron Heckart is really great here as Harvey Dent he's actually really good in the film and I also like that in this film on my recent rewatch what I picked up really uh, very much in this rewatch is that Harvey Dent is a very important part of the film. He's very much one of the main characters, obviously, of the film, but he's also important in terms of just, like, being this important figure who is this guy who um is kind of Batman, but in terms of being this public figure who's helping out crime in Gotham. And that kind of brings Bruce to this idea of does ba- how long does Batman need to be there for? So it calls back to the idea of Bruce, you know, deciding how long he's going to be in that cave with Batman as Batman. And... Uh, it's interesting seeing that and it then has Harvey Dent who makes him wonder how long will how how long should I be Batman because now Harvey Dent is the person that Gotham should have and that's really interesting and I won't go into detail too much but it's interesting how it develops and how it goes along in the film as well as of course um I mentioned that Gary Oldman as Jim Gordon is really good in this film as well actually and I think this is the best utilization of 
Commissioner Gordon in terms of his relationship with Batman and also very much how he how he goes along in the film and the climax with him in the film is really great and Gary Oldman delivers a great performance in that bit it's really terrific like the ending is really great it's a it's a fantastic ending and also the um interrogation scene is really great and so is also the um uh the bit where Batman and so is the the chase where Batman is on the bat cycle chasing the Joker. That's like because I I really like the tumbler scene, but that tumbler scene in, in Batman Begins I really like. But this scene where Batman is chasing the Joker on the bat cycle that trumps that particular scene as a fantastic action scene. That is a really good action scene and it's a really terrific bit. And obviously one of the main things that people remember is that there's an amazing practical effect because Chris Nolan is great with practical effects where the truck is just flipped over and then slammed to the ground. That's terrific. That's really awesome. And to me, that's a really great action bit. I really like that. It's really awesome. And then the, and uh, yeah, the rest of the cast is also terrific. And yeah, there's a lot more top tier scenes there. I'd say in my Nolan ranking, this is number two. But I will say, yeah, this is definitely a great achievement, as I say, from Christopher Nolan. The opening as well, I should say, is also terrific as well. It's a damn good sequel. It's The Dark Knight. You've probably heard of it. You probably have seen it. But if you haven't already, give it a watch because the hype, I think, is definitely justified. Maybe not as high as maybe other people for me, I give it. But I still think it's a really darn great film. And I can see why people rate it so highly. And lastly is The Dark Knight Rises which is the third and final entry and also the more the most controversial entry in the series in this trilogy and whilst i do agree that it's the weakest film in the trilogy i don't think it's as bad as people make it out to be i still think it has a great opening scene for instance involving bane um on the plane that's terrific and i do like the arc that bruce has in this film as well where christian bale continues to be great in the film and also I like that Harvey Dent is still in this film in terms of being such an important part of this trilogy and also important in this in this film. They don't really mention the Joker, and that's because I think Chris Nolan wanted to respect Heath Ledger with the sad passing away of him. But you at least have the character of Harvey Dent being in the film, and also um, the um, other cast, uh, and uh, you have him be mentioned. And uh, the rest of the cast returning are also solid, I think Michael Caine is good as Alfred, especially in the like one scene in the film, which I'll mention. I'll put in my TikTok of like top tier Nolan scenes. Um, this that was really good. And then in terms of the new cast that come along, um, they're also pretty darn solid and nice additions. You have Anne Hathaway as um Catwoman, which I like about her is that she she believes this idea of you know wanting to go into this life of crime not really seeing the good side to Gotham and everything. Um, but Bruce is someone who tries to see and sees that there is a decent person involved in her. And she also has this, I think, this um this younger person who she's friends with, has a sort of relationship with, not in terms of romantic, obviously, but it's like in terms of friendship or daughter sort of thing and trying to protect her and everything. And um, that's interesting that that goes along in the film. And you also have um the character of... um of uh, Commissioner Gordon's uh, uh, relationship with um, this new cop that comes along, played by Joseph Gordon-Levitt, who plays Officer Blake, who I enjoyed in the film as well, where he wants Batman to return, and he's this character who very much wants Batman to go ahead and return, and he's someone who um, uh, wants to go ahead and try to help out as much as he can. He's very determined, and I like his performance in the film. I think Gordon-Levitt does a good job in the film, and there's also a good scene with him and Bruce Wayne as well, where he's able to figure out that Bruce is Batman and he talks about Batman as well. And that's really interesting as well. Um, and it leads to a nice conclusion for like the concluding bits in the film, which I will say this is the conclusion and the way it ends. Overall, is a pretty solid way to end the trilogy. I think it ends quite nicely. And Tom Hardy is Bane. Uh, I know isn't talked about perhaps as much as the Joker, but I do like his character. Arc. I like how he is in the film and his character and uh, the way that this connects to Batman Begins is nice and also I like just how they changed around Bane where he's not comic accurate fully but he does have that intelligence as well as strength that Bane is meant to have 
So I think the main personality and the aspects to Bane in terms of the character is still there intact. So I think it still works. And then, uh, so in terms of why I personally think it's the weakest in the films, I think one of the things I should say as well is that I think people mentioned this. I think someone mentioned this. Uh, maybe I think Chris Stuckman that the sound is a problem. And yeah, I think now, even though I saw Oppenheimer, and I'll mention this in my review, but I did see Oppenheimer in IMAX. That was a special occasion. But aside from that, for the more modern Nolan films, if I'm watching them now, I will put on subtitles because I've always, I've the only thing I've been having with Nolan is he does have a sound issue. And it's a big problem with the issue where I have to put, I will have to put on subtitles because I can't hear what the characters are saying. And it's annoying because it's like with Nolan films, they are very much very focused on making sure you understand what's going on. You have to pay attention. And so with these films, you you need to have. So for these films, I need to have subtitles on now because it's like sometimes I'm just like, I can't understand what is being said because the mixing is a bit off, I think, with the dialogue and then the sound effects with the explosions or some sort of weaponry and then also the music. It's not well handled. That's the problem. And also as well, the punches aren't handled very nicely because the punches aren't really heard in this film. That's why I hear when like Bane's fighting Batman, you don't really hear a lot of the time the punches. It's not. I think someone edited on YouTube better punching sound effects, which is which is good. I I enjoyed seeing that. But um, I think also um yeah, in terms of this film, I think this is the weakest of the bunch. I don't know. It's difficult to say. It's difficult to say if I if I think this or Tenant is weaker. It's tricky to say, and I'm not too sure as of yet. But the scene with Alf, but there is one scene with Alfred, um, that is quite emotional. And I mentioned this that Nolan can do emotional scenes well when he and it's a great scene because it's mostly just the actors being emotionally invested in the roles, and there's no music playing or anything like that, no fancy editing or anything like that. It's simple, but it, that's why it works, and it works really damn well. And I think also that, yeah, the, the arc that they have for Batman is interesting. It's interesting as well that this is a film that I think has one of the least amount of screen times for Batman. Like Batman is in there for the special occasions, but it works, I think, in terms of the story to have Batman return so that his return feels impactful and everything. And that's what's important, I think. And I think the way that this trilogy concludes is overall pretty good. Aside from the sound, I think the only issue as well is the resolution to the villain sort of thing, and also Bane's ex Bane's conclusion in this film, I think was perhaps not handled as well as it could have been. It was a bit disappointing, to be fair. Um, but the way that Batman's concluded and the last moments in the film with the characters and everything, that still works. And I like um the only thing I will say as well is also that I mentioned in The Dark Knight that Jim Gordon was great in this film, but I think um Jim Gordon could have perhaps been seen a little bit more on screen, but I understand why he's not on screen loads, but I would have liked to have seen maybe a bit more of him. But also I do like that um, some of the bits with Gordon involving basically uh, what happened in the previous film and how it how it comes into this film and sort of what how he overall feels is interesting and the way that overall it comes to play is quite interesting. And uh, yeah, and there's one thing as well that I will say is quite nice, which which I'll say this, is that this isn't necessarily a big spoiler, is that Killian Murphy does appear in these three films as Scarecrow, so it's kind of fun to see him be this constant appearing villain that I liked as well. I should say as well that in The Dark Knight, um, Maggie Gyllenhaal um, is one cast member that also replaces Katie Holmes in Batman Begins as the character of Rachel. And um, I think that, I don't think Katie Holmes is as bad as some people make it out to be, and I think Maggie Gyllenhaal also does a good job in this film as well. Um, so I think it's not too much of a problem, but I do think Maggie Gyllenhaal was also good in the film. Maggie Gyllenhaal, that's how you say it. But she's good in the film as well as in Dark Knight. And I think Katie Holmes is not bad. I think she's all right in the first film, Batman Begins. Um, but yeah, The Dark Knight Rises, not as good as the previous ones, but I still think does a good job in concluding this trilogy. Um, but now that I'm done with that, I thought it'd be fun to also talk about um uh because it's game to like just checking the time and everything to go ahead and talk about the time at big finish time at big finish that's what i think it's called yep time at big finish where i will talk about two doctor who audios um 
or rather two audio set within the world of Doctor Who. So first up is Torchwood in the monthly range. Now, for those who don't know, in 2006, um, Doctor Who Series 2 um, was very much a series that expanded the Doctor Who universe. And one way it did that was by kind of setting up the spin-offs. First up was Torchwood. That was the first one where basically it was originally set up mostly in... It was first mentioned in The Christmas Invasion by um, Harriet Jones. And then we had it being introduced in terms of the way it was set up and everything in the Doctor Who universe with the um with the use of uh Queen Victoria where she opened it up as a way to take care of alien threats towards the um British Empire and to the British Isles and to also make sure to keep an eye out for the doctor along with his companion Rose Tyler who was his companion at the time because this was part of the tenth doctor's first series and then in it was shown in series two at the very end that the doctor and Rose met Torchwood fully in in the modern day as this institute to take on any possible alien threats now after that particular conclusion to that series in october a couple of months later a spin-off show was made for doc 2 first shown on bbc3 then moving to bbc2 and bbc1 in the future series running from 2006 to 2011 where captain jack Harkness, last seen in parting of the ways at the very end of series one had suddenly been appearing in the at the time, the present day of 2006 in Cardiff, where he was uh, the leader of a team, a new team at Torchwood in Cardiff, that was not the Torchwood team in London, that was taking on alien threats and making sure to do it in perhaps a more a better way than what they did with the London team. And Torchwood, um, even though it ended in 2011, it basically has had a very loyal fan base, a very loyal uh, fan base that has... Um, been wanting for the series to come back um and basically what tortured also was was a series that would be a spin-off where it would take the doctor universe in more adult territory so it was made for adults it had more adult themes being discussed and shown on screen and it overall i think got better as it went along mainly during up to the third series the fourth series not too sure on that but the third series at least was when tortured was really getting to a big high anyways after tortured's finish in 2011 big finish when they, in 2015 when they acquired uh the uh, license to do doc 2 audios that were with characters and the doctor universe set within the revival so they were able to do audios set within the doc 2 revival from 2005 so do series that um people call new who so audio set within new who one of the first things they did do was audios about tortured where they did monthly audios which they still do the which they still do to this day, where they get, where it's usually kind of bottle episodes where you have a small cast of characters and you mostly have one or two members of Torchwood basically starring in these audios, mostly for, you know, convenience so that the actors are quite busy and some of the actors won't be available. So instead, instead of getting all the actors, instead they just get at least one member of the team and they go ahead and have them in these adventures. Um, so I've listened to a couple of these. Um, there's a couple I've taken a look at. And during December time, and also just after Christmas, I decided to listen to a Torchwood audio that I thought would fit the theme of Christmas. And I thought I'd want to listen to it around Christmas time. And it also happens to be the, um, it stars the character, which surprisingly for me, mainly because I wasn't expecting this character to be one that would be my favorite in terms of the Torchwood monthly audios, is Yanto Jones. Now I haven't listened to all members or an audio that feature. Now I haven't listened to like audios that have every member of the team. So I haven't listened to a Toshiko audio of the monthly range, nor have I listened to one that stars Susie Costello. However, I've listened to a couple starring Yanto Jones, and he has been my favorite because I don't know. I've really enjoyed his stories. His quality of stories have been really solid. The first one I listened to was the second audio in the monthly range called um, "Full to Earth." which is a really, really solid story, which I recommend. Um, but I'm going to take a look at this one because this is a Christmas release. It was released in December of 2021. And it basically has Yanto Jones um, moving to a a small little place in Cardiff. He, uh, it's in this, uh, so the plot synopsis is this. The Mary Lloyd, I don't know how you say that, if I'm saying this right, is a fine Welsh Christmas tradition. The skeleton 
of a horse roams the streets begging to be let in for food and warmth. Once she knocks, only the most cunning can send her away. Yanto Jones has come to a remote village for a quiet Christmas, but the Mary Louise has come knocking and she's real. So yes, this is a Christmas ghost story and the writers of this, Stuart, uh, Stuart Pringle and Lauren Mooney, have said in the behind the scenes um, section of this, uh, which comes with every audio where they have after you've listened to the audio there's a behind the scenes section and in the behind the scenes the writers said that they are big fans of ghost stories and christmas ghost stories so the most famous i mean one of the most famous christmas stories of all time is a christmas carol which is a christmas ghost story and this is very much a christmas ghost story that basically features as it says the mary louise i believe that's its name where yanto jones decides to spend christmas on his own he has come to uh, a remote village for a quiet Christmas. He wants to spend Christmas on his own. He wants to go ahead and just have some peace and quiet for the holidays. And in this story, he, um, the person who gives him the um, the key to the house he's staying in um, uh, is uh, Mrs. Watkins. She's put, her full name is Annie Watkins, played by Ryan Morgan. And I'm going to play a clip where basically Yanto is meeting Mrs. Watkins for the first time. And basically, he's explained to her about wanting to just basically have no problem or fuss during the holidays and basically uh, explains, you know, staying at Christmas on their own, on his own. So here's a clip from the Grey Mare for you to listen to. Hope you enjoy listening to it. Oh, shall we put these in the kitchen? Just through here? Mm hmm Perfect. <laughs> Feeding the 5,000. You did read the bit I wrote about parties, didn't you? The bit that said no parties? That's the one. Now, it'll sleep three comfortably, but if there's any more, there's blankets in the press upstairs. Nope, nobody else. It's just me. Just you? On your lonesome? But it's Christmas. You can't be on your own at Christmas. Well, that's actually sort of the point. I just wanted, well... No carol singers, no parties around Uncle Kevin's with his horrible farting Rottweiler, no Boxing Day walk around Roth Park in the pouring rain. No, none of it. Right. Sounds very quiet. God, I hope so. Well, it's a quiet sort of place here, mostly. So that gives you an idea as to what this audio is. So this is a, so that's kind of a little audio, uh, little section that just gives you an idea as to what this audio is about in terms of it's a very um it's very much um so the audio clip that i played was just there to get you introduced it wasn't to spoil much so the marion louise hasn't really been appearing yet in the audio uh it's mostly just annie mrs watkins meeting yanto and she's surprised as you can tell she's surprised that you know yanto wants to spend christmas on his own but he he very much does want to at the start but i think what this audio does a good job at is kind of giving the idea of you know not wanting to, of realising, you know, it's not right to spend Christmas on your own. And Gareth David Lloyd actually did say that in his, really, in his one point in his life, he did want to spend Christmas on his own. And he said it was horrible. And this is an audio that I think reflects that also in terms of it. And um, also, I think as well, the the ghost of the Mary Louise is a well-constructed uh, ghost um, as well. I can't remember too much about this. I can't remember everything about this audio because it's been a while since I've listened to it. But I will say that I think this is the one audio that has now taken over Fall to Earth as so far my favourite in the Torture Monthly range. This was overall a really, really solid Christmas um, tortured audio. And it's one that I would gladly listen to every like year for Christmas as a fun Christmas audio to listen to. It's fun to listen to, but it's also got some good drama to it. And the interactions with Mrs. Watkins and uh, Yanta is great as well. And with that clip as well, it's just the script by Stuart Pringle and Laura Mooney is also great because the dialogue is just really great to listen to. I just like listening to these characters interact. And you now have loads of characters as well. The other character you have as well is like Jim, who I believe is someone who is like nearby that accompanies Mrs. Watkins and Yanto in terms of the journey. And uh, you also have um, Daniel. I can't remember too much. I might have been a young person, I think it was in this audio. But it's um it's a really solid audio i think and um the way that the ghost uh, i think psychologically works around it is really interesting as well and it's interesting as well seeing yanto going ahead and um even though he's not working for torture or doesn't plan to work as like sort of 
what he usually does doesn't he doesn't plan to do his work at the moment instead you know trying to relax it's great to see him like try to calm down annie and uh, make sure to keep the situation at calm and try to sort out this problem that he usually solves most of the time and um i also think that the way that the audio ends is really nice as well where it has a very nice conclusion involving annie and um yanto and i think yeah the character of annie played by um uh uh roger ryan morgan ryan morgan overall did a or ryan morgan i'm not sure he said that name is overall really good in the story and i think that's what makes it really really solid it's similar to i think why i like fall to earth so much is a tortured audio because that audio has um the character of yanto interact with mostly this person on the phone and their interactions it's mostly just those two in that audio and that's a really good audio because you just have those two interacting with each other and with this audio you just have a small cast of people involved but it works and it tells a really effective ghost story that is both scary it's funny and it's overall a really solid story it's not massively scary in terms of like outright gonna frighten you or jump at you but it has a good building atmosphere to it and with the fire crackling as well it has almost a sense of relaxing as well where you kind of get that feeling of what Yanto wants to feel of that relaxation, that peace and quiet that he wants to feel for the holidays. And that's what works about it. And overall, yeah, I think this was a, this was a really solid tortured audio. And it's my favorite of the monthly range so far because it just worked as a really solid audio that even though I didn't listen to it on the Christmas day, I still think it works even when you're not listening to it at Christmas time. But if you are listening on Christmas time, you're just going to be hunting by the being by the blanket or whatever by the fireplace and you're just going to be listening to this really great story that builds on a really cool atmosphere as well and um has a really great um ghost story and i like sort of the old classic idea in horror films where it takes that old trope in horror films where it's a um it's a very like it's a ghost story this famous folk tale that's told through generations and it's like known across the village and it's kind of like the Wicker Man or something like that, which I haven't seen, but I know it's kind of, I imagine that sort of thing or some other classic horror film where it's like this, some new visitor comes along and finds out about this old folk tale that's quite frightening and uh, is well known in the village. It's a well-known talking point. And um, yeah, that's, I think, I think what makes it effective. It works to tell this very effective ghost story that um, I really enjoyed. And I think if you enjoy your Christmas ghost stories or you enjoy your ghost stories, or oh, the classic sort of idea of, you know, visitor comes to this place, this village or town, and finds out about this folk tale, this ghost story that turns out to be real. I think you're gonna enjoy the um the I think you're gonna enjoy the Grey Man. It's a really solid um tortured audio. Um and the second one I want to talk about, aside from that one, is uh another tortured as a is a doctor audio. So even though David Tennant is no longer our current doctor. He was there for a bit, obviously, um, for the 60th anniversary specials. I want to talk about a Doctor Who audio that he starred in, which I listened to when I was at the gym. I decided to listen to it because I've listened to this one before, but I wanted to listen to it, re-listen to it, re-listen to it, and take a look and see, you know, what would listen, check out for myself. What did I what did I think of it? You know, what was my overall thoughts on this particular audio has it changed or anything like that and uh also just to maybe think you know what maybe i'll go ahead and give a review of this so the audio in question is a doctor audio released during lockdown yeah it was called august it was released in august of 2020 written by matt fitton and it's a very big high profile doctor audio that i'm sure many people are very eager to maybe listen to and this is out of time one written by matt fitton now, even though it says out of time one here, it's just called out of time here because originally I think this was planned to just be a one-off Doc 2 audio, but then Big Finish decided to go ahead and make this sort of a trilogy where the trilogy's premise is that the 10th Doctor is facing off a iconic Doc 2 monster. And in this one, it's the Daleks. And then you have the Cybermen in the second one and, the, and then the Weeping Angels in the third one. And... Um, in each of those stories, he's facing off an iconic monster, the three most well-known monsters, I think, of Doc 2. And then he's also paired up with a different Doctor. And in this case, it's Doctors of the Classic Era. So the first one here is the fourth Doctor, 
then you have the fifth doctor and the second one and the sixth doctor and the third one now this one was obviously i imagine made and kind of thought about for a while i think it, from what i heard it was thought about for a while but david tennant for a while was kind of busy but because of lockdown he was kind of mostly like he was available at least more so than he usually is um where he pairs where i imagine big finish you know thought of this idea because this is an idea that i think you know fans have wanted for where you have the tenth doctor paired up with the fourth doctor the most popular doctors in a storyline together and this basically has a um and the storyline in this case is set where the tenth doctor is basically deciding to visit this church this area which is known as the cathedral of contemplation where the doctor at one point decides to go ahead and at one point try to check out a place that the um abbess who's kind of like the monk the priest the hierarchy person in charge at one point tells the doctor he can't visit and the abbess is voiced by um claire rushbook who you'll probably reckon who if you're wondering is was in doctor who beforehand she played ida scott in the apostle planet the same pit she was the um person that was with the 10th doctor when uh during the satan pit where the 10th doctor and her were kind of stuck and uh separated from the rest of the crew in that storyline you might remember and uh here she plays the abbess this kind of hierarchy person in charge of the church that was well, sorry the cathedral of contemplation and this cathedral also opens up to different time areas time corridors and because of the time corridors um this leads to the dalek suddenly intervening and before that happens as well the tenth doctor messing about with the cathedral in terms of trying to uh, uh you know go ahead and explore a place that the abbess as i said told him not to go to he tries to tries to like find that place you know tries to get into that area um and then because of that he accidentally finds himself going away back in time to a different time place a different place in the cathedral where he finds himself interacting with rather a former version of himself the fourth doctor played by tom baker and um the fourth doctor here uh meets the tenth doctor whilst the fourth doctor is also with this uh this uh young woman played by Catherine drysdale known as uh jora who is someone who uh, we later find out is kind of running away from this war that her father is fighting in and it turns out this war is against the daleks who have gone through the time corridors and have gone ahead and tried to take over the cathedral to go ahead and also control time and win the war not just the war they're currently in but all wars and so it's up to the tenth doctor and the fourth doctor to work together to go ahead and sort out the uh problem however once i play the clip here that i'm back where the fourth doctor meets the tenth doctor the tenth doctor tries to disguise that he's not the doctor that he's not a future incarnation so as to not draw attention to the fourth doctor or to get the fourth doctor so confused this is basically where the tenth doctor suddenly meets the uh, fourth doctor and he also uh reunites in a way with Jorah, someone who he worked who he was with when he was in his fourth incarnation so here's a clip from out of time one you've broken a dimension wall smashed clean through it and fused the controls for an accidental tourist you're either very clever or very clumsy a little bit of both let's go with that is this michelangelo aha no but i did model for him once hello um jora hello jora yes Mm, I see now why there's so many barriers. That'll teach me to peek behind the curtain. This space exists across multiple time zones. We can't have them bumping into each other. There'd be chronological chaos. <laughs> yes, yes, wouldn't there? Nice frescoes. Actually, Michelangelo visited once, had a ceiling to paint, needed some inspiration, or else he'd have finished off the Sistine with two, two coats, coats of, magnolia. of magnolia. How do you know about that? The abbess um, mentioned it. Michelangelo ceilings... Um, Anyway, I've probably outstayed my welcome. Not at all, not at all. Besides, this interface is kaput. There's no getting back to where you came from. Uh. Wait, I thought you brought Michelangelo. Did he? Did he? Did he, though? Don't believe everything you're told. Isn't that right? Ah. Uh. Doctor, oh. quite right. Never let the truth get in the way of a good story, Mr. Uh, Mr. Whoever you are. John S mm, Tyler. John Tyler, pleased to meet you. By the way, Jorah, did the doctor ask why you're hiding? hiding uh no hmm maybe he should 
So re-listening to this story, I actually would say that I had a really good time listening to this actually at the gym. For one thing, it has a really good script to it that's very well written, but also at the same time, it's a very fun, easygoing adventure that I could have just listened to whilst I was, you know, working out at the gym. Um, <laughs> I'm not doing that to show off my muscles. Um, but no, it was it's a good story to listen to in a casual way and also one that you can pay attention to and still have a good time. And it's just overall a really, really solid story that not, that has this pairing work really darn well. And as you heard from the clip, um, the doctor, the temp doctor, almost says John Smith, but then he changed it to John Tyler. That's a really good bit there that I really like. And also as well, what's really good about this script that I really picked up on, especially in this story. And I, I've listened to this before, but I especially picked it up on my most recent listen that the temp doctor is um this in the there's an interesting placement behind where the tenth doctor and the fourth doctor are in their timelines the fourth doctor is um tr you know traveling on his own this is set after the hand of fear uh but before the face of evil so this is before the fourth doctor meets leela and this is but this is after he has said goodbye to sarah jane smith so it's interesting seeing that kind of bit with the fourth doctor where he's not really with any companion he is with jorah this soldier who is uh, of course at a war with the daleks um but he's running away from you know being a soldier and the fourth doctor and the tenth doctor are kind of comforting her and saying you know there's not you you're not really a coward it's not really a cowardly thing to you know go ahead and ru uh, run away and uh, actually was it she's played by um catherine drysdale as i said who i believe was um uh the um the character play was in Love and Monsters as Bliss, which I didn't realize until uh, Mr. Tardis did a re review on it and he pointed this out. And I saw his review um, before I listened to the audio, but listening to it now, I definitely really enjoyed it. And I think Mr. Tardis made a good point that actually it can be a good audio to listen to as kind of one of your first. And I think it will definitely be one that many people might want to listen to. It's with this and the Temp Doctor Adventures Volume 1 box set, which I also think is a really good audio to have as your first introductions to big finish it's how i listened to big finish first actually the temp doctor adventures was like the first thing i got from big finish uh, my parents bought it for me but i bought that box set and it was one of the first things i listened to that was from the company i knew about them for a while but yeah it's one of the first things i bought and the out of time box set is overall a really solid um, box set that has the fourth doctor as i said placed during an interesting timeline but the tenth doctor even more so because these three stories, anyways, the Out of Time trilogy is set when the Tenth Doctor is in the specials where he's traveling on his own. And it's after he's, you know, not traveling with Donna. And of course, with that particular setting, you know, loads of expanded media have done the Tenth Doctor in that setting where it's set before the events of, of course, his regeneration, but also set after he's traveled with Donna. And it's interesting as well um, because you have the Tenth Doctor here going ahead and wanting to not let the fourth doctor die and everything and also say what happens to me and he also says that the reason he's gone to the um the 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 um the place of content the uh i keep forgetting its name it's the uh it's the um the cathedral of contemplation i almost said church all the time cathedral of contemplation the reason why he goes there is because um he wants he's not ready to go because it's, I believe, set after Pat the Dead, where he's being told that, you know, uh, he will knock four times. And he's worried, of course, about his more mortality, that this incarnation is going to die, that he's going to end up being dead. And there's obviously loads of expanded media that's taken on the specials, sort of like in, around the specials timeline. Like, uh, I'm reading currently the Titan comics of the Tenth Doctor, which is set during the specials as well, where he's not traveling with Donna anymore. Um and in this case, it's to also, to, it also brings in a little bit about the Daleks, which I won't give in too much, but it does come back to the genesis of the Daleks bit of also, do I have the right? And also talking about that in this story in an interesting way. So the Daleks are utilized in an interesting way, whilst also being a fun threat for the Doctors to be paired up with. You know, they're up against this iconic monster, the most iconic monster. And on the cover art, you'll see that the Daleks have their classic design in terms of how they're meant to be well you can't see them but they're based on the classic designs but then you also have the supreme dalek who is um based on the 2008 design and nicholas briggs does a great job with the supreme dalek he just really gets into that role he's always great with the daleks anyways but 
with the Supreme, he's able to do a different voice, the more booming voice, and it works really well because it often leads to a more interesting uh, talking point behind the Doctors, and it works really darn well. And this story overall is a really, it's overall a really fun adventure, whilst also, as I said, bringing in interesting themes such as where the Tenth Doctor is placed in and his discussions with the Fourth Doctor, which I think is really special to take a look at. And I overall think that it's a really solid audio that I think most would enjoy as a really fun adventure for the, the uh, for the scene, the, you know, these doctors paired up together and it's just really fun to listen to. And I overall had a, a really solid time listening to it this time on my current listen. I listened to a bit of it on the gym and then I think I listened to the rest of it when I went back home. And it was overall really good to listen to, actually. So, yeah, I would say that I definitely recommend Out of Time 1 as an audio within the um, Temp Doctor Zero. And I just overall think that it has this great pairing up that also works really well, where David Tennant is also really solid in the audio. It's really fun with their inter with his interactions with Tom Baker, who also does a really darn good job. Even like years later after playing the role, he still just really captures the fourth Doctor really well and just has that great enthusiasm, I think, to that role. You can tell that he's just having a good job and enjoying the time playing the fourth Doctor in the same way that David Tennant is still really obviously enjoying playing the 10th Doctor. This is before he took on number 14, obviously, but he does a great job here um, as well. And yeah, they're both doing a really solid job as well as the rest of the cast. And it overall, it's just a really solid, fun adventure. And actually, what I will say is that if you do buy this audio, you should also maybe check out, if you want to perhaps have some visuals towards this audio, uh, you should check out Josh Snez, uh, who is a well-known Doctor Who uh, youtuber you may have even heard of them but they basically did a um they basically did a uh on youtube you can take a look at this a doctor who um fan animation they've done two i believe it is where basically there is a doctor who out of time animation where they basically go ahead and they've done an out of an animation of doctor who out of time so the only thing about this I will say as well is Josh Snez says this at the start. Um, so Josh says at the start of this that they can't exactly play the audio for copyright reasons, but the best way to approach it and the way that you can do it is you can listen to the audio. So if you downloaded the audio, you play it and it gives you a countdown as well, five, four, three, two, one. And as soon as the audio, as soon as the animation starts, you play the audio and it plays in time and it works really well. And it's the best approach to go along with it. So I think it's still really really works so yeah this it really works and i'd say i'm i'm gonna re-listen to our time too which i've listened to beforehand but i'll listen to that i think after i've gone ahead and watched the all the fifth doctor zero because i'm near the end of it and actually the last story i listened to the last story of the fifth doctor i watched sorry on screen was resurrection of the daleks and um funny enough the time corridors that get mentioned with the daleks was like making me realize oh it's based around that or at least that's kind of what it reminds me of, because the time, because in that story in Resurrection of the Daleks, the Daleks are using time corridors, which are like these doors that take them to different places and different time zones. So that is kind of what it reminds me of with um, the Daleks in that. Um, but yeah, I, I'll listen to Out of Time to uh, re-listen to that as well once I've gone through all the Fifth Doctor Zero. That you know, because once I've watched all the Fifth Doctor Zero, I then decide I've seen all of him on screen. Now I feel confident in wanting to watch, listen to his big finish. And the same thing could go for the sixth Doctor as well, where I'll go ahead and watch all the sixth Doctor and then listen to him on big finish, and then the same for the seventh Doctor. That's just how I like doing things. Uh, the only exception may be Life at the End, which is the 50th anniversary audio, which I own. That'll be the only exception. But aside from that, I'll listen to those Doctors uh, on audio once I've finished their eras. Same goes for the other Doctors as well. So... Overall, yeah, I'd say recommendation for Out of Time 1. Um, and yeah, I think especially if you want to see these Doctors paired up and if you haven't listened to much Big Finish as well, I think it could be, a, I think it's a good audio to listen to. And also it's just a fun one to listen to. And also one that if you want to listen to something that's a bit more casual and not one to focus on too heavily in terms of too much complexity in terms of the themes and everything, it's mostly a fun adventure to listen to whilst you're doing some work or whatever. It's just in the background. That's a good point as well. That's a good one to go and listen to. And yeah, if you have downloaded it, check out Josh Snare's animation as well. I think you'll really enjoy it. I've seen a bit of it, but I'll have to watch all of it, actually. Um, yeah, I'll have to watch all of it. And 
check it out. But yeah, recommendation for Out of Time One and also Grey Man. Double recommendations, really solid ones, uh, really good ones to listen to. But now it's time to finally take a look at the, uh, I'm just taking the time as well, checking the time. Finally time to take a look at the church on Ruby Road, because obviously that was the, I was going to start with that, but I thought I want to get on bowl. I want to go ahead and talk about the other bits and pieces first. But now here we are with the church on Ruby Road. Now, I, as I said, I listened to this on boxing. I watched the church on Ruby Road on Boxing Day. And um, I watched that because I wanted, because of Christmas Day, I'm with my family or whatever. So I couldn't have had the time. But now I'm finding time to take a look at Church on Ruby Road and to take a look at this particular Doctor Who um, story that I think is really overall uh, one that I personally was very eager to take a look at. Uh, I was very excited to see mainly what Shooty would bring to the table because Shooty, uh, I think, was really solid in the giggle, but obviously he wasn't. It wasn't his first full adventure. That was the that would be the next story, Church on Ruby Road, and also the Church on Ruby Road is really the story that kind of sets up more so of the RTD era because you have the new characters coming along, and you also have just the overall new Doctor and companion dynamic, and I do think that overall. Um, I thought it was pretty solid. I don't know if it was my favourite Doctor Who story ever or my favourite post-regeneration story, but I think it was a solid enough adventure that did a nice job in introducing the Doctor. And I think one thing as well about Shooty, I've noticed that in the first story already, he's wearing loads of different costumes as well. And it's interesting as well that um, there's the celebrity of... Um, uh, I mentioned before about this, about... Um, uh, uh, the um, the uh, actor, uh, and the uh, Big Brother presenter, who I mentioned before, which I won't get into too much because I already mentioned a bit of the some controversy surrounding it, but uh, surrounding it, but I won't get into that because I think I may have messed up saying that. But um, what was the name of the um, Big Brother presenter? It was uh. I, I'm sorry if I'm like sometimes not remembering bits and pieces, but it's getting a bit like it's getting a, it is a bit annoying sometimes for me to like just something not remember it. Uh, it was it was 2000, like the original presenter of Big Brother, Davina McCall. That's her name. That's her name, Davina McCall. Right. So at the moment, I think she still presents this, but apparently she does present a real show, Long Lost Family. So it is a real show she presents now. And in the show, it it kind of connects to the real life show connects to what's happening at the moment where you have her basically meeting Ruby and basically trying to find her family at some point. And um, the way that um, Ruby and that bit, I think, was quite cool as well. And I do like that Shooty's Doctor is kind of hidden in the background mostly because it kind of has almost a Rose point of view, as in the episode Rose, where you have um, the character of Ruby going ahead and um but uh seeing the doctor at multiple places but the doctor doesn't appear loads not until i think the bit where the doctor fully meets ruby uh in terms of the ladder which was a clip that was shown before the episode was shown where you have the doctor deciding to go ahead and uh meet with ruby and uh and you know say uh say that he's the doctor and they go up to this goblin ship which is a really cool looking ship as well i think the design of that was really cool and actually the goblins were really cool as well and the thing about the goblins as well that i loved as well which i was so surprised by is that they're not cgi they're actually practical um they're actually practical the goblins are practical um effects which i couldn't really believe that um these i go on to doctor unleashed there's a uh, there's a bit about these uh, goblins being practical effects, which, um, yeah, I don't know if you can see, but the goblins themselves, yeah, there they go. The goblins here are practical effects, which just I completely couldn't believe, really, because it's like they actually look really darn great looking and just uh, they have a lot of expression. I think some of them might be CGI, but there's a number of them that are practical, and I just love that. They are practical, including also the Goblin King as well which um, I couldn't really believe that either. I was like, the Goblin King being not CGI was a bit of a surprise. And um, the Goblins themselves as well, 
I think were a lot of fun as well as I think they're fun as villains because they're very much akin to these mischievous characters that remind me of like gremlins and the Goblin King is kind of this Jabba the Hutt like character who I like seeing on screen and um and I love that the campiness of Ross Tevis is still there where the goblins sing up a song the goblin song which I thought was really really fun to listen to but what I couldn't really be I was so surprised then after that song was playing that we then had um the uh goblin uh the, the character of the doctor and ruby singing the singing as well and they have to improvise singing both of them as well and um and then you have shooty um you know saying um uh, the doctor saying hit it janice and he, they hit up a song and it's like i couldn't believe that but i love that i love that they are singing and it kind of almost gives you an idea that they are probably going to do a musical episode of doctor who i like musicals so you know bring on the Bring on the trumpets, as the advert says. Bring on the trumpets. Um, I'm very, I'd be very excited to see what they do with that. And um, I also think that Millie Gibson did a good job as Ruby Sunday as the companion. I liked her character and the performance as well. And I like that she has a fun dynamic with the Doctor, and also that she is this character that has this interesting storyline behind her that you don't really know what her parents are. And actually, what I really didn't expect and was a really cool twist was the Doctor suddenly realize suddenly having the idea that the ruby suddenly is no longer there that ruby is suddenly banished and i believe it was down to coincidences or like coincidences or something like that i think it was like um something akin to that where they're searching up but the goblins uh they like messing about but there's also to do with um if i go on to it uh, church on ruby road uh there just going on my phone to search out the plot of this but the um goblins are down to like predictions and also like coincidences or something like that in terms of the power that they have um and that was particularly interesting i think i think that was interesting that that's the power that they have or possess really uh my phone is getting really slow on this hold on a minute sorry about this uh church on ruby road doctor who uh da, 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 da. Uh, yeah, it was it was like something akin to it. I I've been trying to see if I can find it on it or something, but um uh, part of this wiki sort of thing yeah it was kind of um but it was interesting because um uh okay uh, yeah the church on ruby road story on tv um uh, Yeah, chance, luck, coincidences is what they play about. And then what happens later on is Ruby disappears. And the way that that is introduced is really, really fascinating. And actually as well, what I like as well is that with that bit and the Doctor's reaction, the heartbroken reaction, and also just the bit that he says, the Doctor saying that he's an orphan as well, and the way that emotion plays in, and the way that Shooty, I think, is more emotionally vulnerable or opens up more emotionally than other Doctors is really interesting, and I like that as well. And also, um, Ruby's, I think it's like Grandma, was really funny in this story as well. And then you had Ruby's um, foster mum, who's also really fun and good to see in terms of the introductions. And then you had um, the uh, the uh, the main, well, at the very end of the story, you have uh, Mrs. Flood, who's this, uh, played by a famous actor, uh, the famous actor, yeah, Anita Dobson, who um, at the very end, uh, who... Um, is a, a fun character as well and uh um and the way that um the overall story is is overall i think i think because of the funness of the goblins and the campiness and everything i think that's mainly there to just be there for the christmas feel 
give you the idea of the Christmas spirit. I think one thing as well is that this definitely has shown with this and the three specials that Moffat is right in terms of it doesn't feel as much like Russell's previous era. It does feel different in a way. And I like that. It's more of a modern TV feel, but it works. And I overall think that uh, it was really solid in terms of how it went. I may have spoiled a bit of it, actually. I might have regret that. Sorry about that. Um, I feel bad about that. I should say that this does contain spoilers of the church on Ruby Road. I spoiled a bit of it. Um, sorry about that. Um, quite a bit of it, I think. Um, but the cast overall was solid. It sets up the building blocks quite well. And I think overall, yeah, it's a solid adventure that I've said a bit about, actually, and I feel kind of bad about that. So just for the sake, I'll say this. It does contain spoilers about it. Um, I'll just say this. There is a bit of spoilers that I'm talking about on Church on Ruby Road. I think it's just because I'm looking at the time and we're overflowing with time sort of thing. So overall, I'll say this about the Church on Ruby Road. That overall, I think it's not my overall favorite, maybe Christmas episode or favorite post regeneration episode, but overall, I enjoyed it. Um, there's an overall enjoyment to be had with this episode. And actually, I believe that this is also going to get a novelization as well. Not from Target, but I think from some other company. But there is a novel being made for the Church and Ruby Road. So that's pretty cool as well. And I overall think that's pretty cool. I think one of the cast members is doing an audiobook of this. Um, so that's pretty cool as well. But um, talking about it, I'm going to talk more about in spoiler depths and everything. Um, so now that I've talked a bit about it, I want to actually talk about spoilers in more in depth, even though I have spoiled quite a bit of it. So I'm going to go ahead and say three, two, one. Thank you for listening and watching the video. If you have already listened to it, uh, share a like and subscribe as well. Um, uh, if you haven't seen it before, uh, uh, if you want to see more episodes as well I, I will do a there is a playlist on my YouTube channel for the podcast as well as segments which I'll put up as well but moving aside from that and talking about the church on Ruby Road I'm going to talk about in more in-depth spoilers I know I've already spoiled a bit of it but hopefully you'll still enjoy the episode and hopefully I won't give away too much so anyways talking about the episode uh, talking about the Doc 2 episode Let's delve into more spoilers. So I did the three, two, one countdown. And also to say thank you for listening and watching. Remember to stay chillaxing and always remember to keep chit chan. Um, thank you for watching or listening to the video. But now three, two, one, more spoilers or rather full spoilers for the church on Ruby Road. Um, so a bit of a mishap there. Apologies for spoiling it already. But I did enjoy the episode. As I said, the musical numbers were really fun as well. The goblin ship was really cool in terms of the design. I liked the design that they had there. And also the Doctor just being very fun in terms of the personality and also being more emotional in terms of opening up about saying he's an orphan and everything. And also as well, when Ruby disappears, as in he, she's vanished almost from history, or rather the goblins have snatched her out, is really great. And that was a great twist, actually, um, that I look back on as probably most exciting bit as well and it's interesting as well that you have that bit kind of be the opening of the story where the doctor is a bit sad and look going out of the TARDIS looking sad looking out there and the snow there and everything is really nice and cool it gives you that really good Christmas feel to it as well I will be listening I will be watching this as well after just before the um, new series hits in I think May I think it is so I'm going to still check out the new series I'm still going to check out this episode again uh, before the episode, before the series hits in May. And um, I really like as well, like just that this um, that this episode overall was quite fun. But that bit as well also shows in a bit more of the drama. And you also have the Doctor being with Ruby's grandma, having this fun dynamic. She wants tea and then the Doctor is kind of being quite fun around with her. That's really fun to watch. And Ruby's foster mum is also really nice in terms of the character and being this character that, seemingly has taken on loads and loads of kids and it's interesting as well that um she goes ahead and has um the doctor she goes and has these pictures as well which has all these children and then suddenly when ruby's gone there's not much pictures at all which was a bit of a real big surprise to see as well and um ruby deciding to take on deciding to travel with the doctor and realizing he's a time traveler knowing it might be dangerous but going in anyways is a fun bit as well 
and uh the uh shooty saying i'm the doctor at the end is really nice and cool and um uh that was cool to see and uh i also um liked um seeing just like i also liked actually that there's one scene that i had mentioned yet where the doctor saves i believe it's like this woman who has a baby pram it's about to fall from goblins goblins are falling down this giant snowman turns out the woman's not got any baby it's like groceries or whatever and that's just funny and then there's also i think this other person this policeman or something that asks if the doctor's okay and then the doctor goes in and says about this guy going to propose to his um girlfriend and that bit right there was very much eight doctor vibes that's what i got because the eight doctor i remember in the tv movie would be someone who kind of predicts what's going on and like knows about a person could read a person and it's a really interesting little bit there again i i really liked it um if there's one thing that hasn't been liked perhaps from shooty gat was doctor it's the sonic screwdriver which i'll admit i'm not as much of a fan of as say the latest sonic aside from you know the one that shooty has the one that the 14th doctor had i'm not sure why they changed the sonic maybe to give shooty his own sonic i suppose but it does look a bit like a TV remote. It is a bit of a bizarre one that I'm not too sure on. It does look a bit weird. It actually looks a bit like something from, I don't know why, but I'm thinking Teletubbies. Like the TARDIS already sometimes gets compared to the Teletubbies house. And this looks like something from Teletubbies, like some sort of, like I know the Sonic is meant to be obviously a toy that maybe kids buy, but this looks even more like some sort of kid device thing. It's like if I use my Sky Remote or whatever, and I'm using that as the Sonic, it's a, very unique one that I'm not too sure on. It's interesting as well that even though Shooty's first costume um, was revealed um, as kind of the um, as kind of like this costume, we have yet to really see it. We've seen mostly Shooty wear this leather jacket look, which I like. Some people kind of thought that that was um, that Donna would kind of be turning into the Fifteenth Doctor, or that you know the Fifteenth Doctor gets the leather jacket from Donna. Which is kind of funny, but it does look a bit like Donna. But also, I do like the trainers that the Doctor has. It's a very casual look as well, whilst also being quite stylish. Like, there's a casualness to it with the trainers and teeth uh, and trousers. Um, but also the nice leather jacket and T-shirt that he's wearing. It's kind of cool, that. Um, it's definitely interesting that he's gone ahead and worn so many costumes. Much as, like, the fifth, third Doctor or something like that. It's like, often in modern Doctor's cases, they've been wearing the same sort of clothes even donna jokes about this to the temp dog it's like you don't wear this you, you don't wear any other clothes or something like that with in partners in crime it's like he's wearing the same suit um but yeah it's interesting that and um also yeah i think um the bit with the policeman was quite nice where he knows what the guy's going to do propose to his girlfriend that was interesting seeing that and then you had the 14th and then you had number 15 uh and ruby's relationship and there's a fun dynamic there as well to be had where they both have this kind of like arguing sort of thing where it's like she got the he got the they've got the baby and like the doctor's like saying what are you doing on a ladder for sort of thing but also they're kind of like best friends sort of thing and um i can see kind of that fun friend dynamic that comes into this um dynamic with these two companion doctor pairings um because i think shooty has described it and maybe millie has described it as kind of a school kids like sort of best friends like being quite cheeky fun sort of characters which is uh sounds a lot of fun and i'm excited to see what they do and actually the next time trailer that was shown at the end was very exciting for me i think it looked very very cool very very exciting to see that and to see kind of um uh what happens next um and to see kind of um and to see kind of like what happens later on and um uh, uh to see what happens in the future of the series with like the abbey road being shown and uh seeing what happens in the future of the series it all looks very very exciting and i'm i'm interested to see what they bring into the next series um i'm not sure what the each episode is going to be like what the finale is going to be like what the story is going to be like but it's going to be pretty cool uh, i do know some bits and pieces because doctor unleashed there was anita dobson i believe the name is as uh, mrs flood who was uh yeah, played by uh yeah. anita dobson yeah who does a good job playing this role of um the neighbor of ruby and um i think um the ending part was particularly interesting where she goes to the audience and says never seen a talus before and then winks to the camera 
And I'm, uh, it does make it interesting. And I think Russell has said that it's very slowly going to build up. So it's not going to be immediately shown who she exactly is, but it'll hopefully be interesting to see what they do with her. It'll be interesting, but um, hopefully it's going to be satisfying to see what they do with her. And I think it should hopefully, hopefully it'll work. Um, and yeah, I think it was interesting. And I think um, that was pretty cool. The uh, Goblin King, the Goblins being defeated and that sort of idea of coincidence and luck was interesting as well um and also um i think as well uh, uh, uh the um uh with the um also i should say as well is um uh the one other thing i should mention as well about the church on ruby road as well was um the Doctor unleashed overall. The Goblins actually was it. The Goblin King getting defeated. I think it was getting impaled. That was I was surprised to see that. I was like, oh okay, interesting seeing that. And uh, I don't know if I've really found them scary, but I found them like fun, entertaining little gremlins to see. And um, it's interesting as well that uh, <laughs> the character of um of a uh, uh, well not the character Davina McCall she's playing herself gets injured ends up in a wheelchair whatever and it's like okay uh, she gets injured by that. And then Ruby's also injured, and it's often luck as well, which I thought was interesting. And um, yeah, I did like, um, as I said, the Rose bit at the start where Ruby, it's through Ruby's point of view most of the time, which I thought was quite interesting. So yeah, overall, I think I very much, I don't think I would say it's my favourite episode, just because like I had a good time with it, but I wouldn't say like by the end of it, I was like, whoa, that was amazing, that was mind-blowing or something like that. It was a solid enough episode that I think builds up and it's really the real sort of introduction to this era of Ross T. Davis, whereas the 60th was kind of bridging the gap between the modern series that we had in the past and now this new modern series that's coming along with Shooty. So what happens next? Not sure what to happen. Not sure what's going to happen. But overall, I did have a good time with the Church on Ruby Road. And as I said, there's a number of points I liked. I think just because when I have sort of like that rating, it's nothing down to major flaws or anything like that. It's just overall, I thought the episode was just good, but never anything that really blew my mind. The Ruby vanishing was pretty cool. That was a good bit. But aside from that, the rest of it, pretty good. I'm interested to see what they do also with Shooty's Doctor as it goes along. And I might have to think more about how I think Shooty's Doctor was in this episode, because I enjoyed them maybe more in the giggle than this. I don't know. But I have to see what it turns out with the next episodes. But as for now, I'm going to wrap up this episode and... Uh, yeah, I think for now it's going to wrap up this episode for the Church on Ruby Road and also the other things I talked about, movies and uh, Big Finish. So that's going to be the end of it for now. But now I'm going to say thank you very much for uh, watching or listening to the Chillaxing and Chit Chat podcast. Apologies for spoilers. I'll put text up, I think, for the start of this podcast episode. That's for a future note. Um, put up text saying this contains spoilers of the Church on Ruby Road. So just watch the episode first before I talk about it because I don't realise that I spoiled it, but I was like, okay, I'll fix that. I'll get around working around that. But anyways, for now, I'm going to wrap up this episode as I say. Um, so I hope you enjoyed listening or watching this episode of the Chaxing and Chit Chat podcast. Um, I hope you also have enjoyed listening to the other episodes of the 60th anniversary specials and my thoughts and opinions on those. And uh, basically, uh, sound off in the comments down below uh, what your overall thoughts were on the episodes as well. Be interested to know. Or if your thoughts on the movies I reviewed, the Dark Knight trilogy, and also the big finish audios I talked about, anything else, um, and what you just overall thought of the episode and um, this podcast episode. And uh, yeah, uh, be sure to leave a like if you enjoyed it, and also subscribe if you want to keep up to date with my episodes of the podcast. And also go ahead and uh, you can check out on my YouTube channel. I'll put up a playlist that will have my previous episodes. You can also just see on my YouTube channel the other episodes and everything. And yeah, you can you can take a look and see those episodes. And uh, yeah, I should be now uploading. Hopefully, uh, I should have uploaded all the episodes uh, to date of the 60th anniversary specials, and then. This, of course, with the Church on Ruby Road and then also the um, other things I talked about. But yeah, I also hope as well that considering that I did talk about a tortured Christmas audio and the Christmas special of Doctor Who, that you also had a good Christmas. Let me know about that. And um, I also have a playlist which will have segments for reviews of everything, like 
movies or the big finish audios so you can take a look at that as well um so yeah and uh, all i'll say now is uh remember to uh stay chillaxing and always remember to keep chit-chatting thank you for listening or watching